Good evening. Hi. I am the Maven of the Eventide, a.k.a. Elisa Hansen, which is my real name. And I have just reached 13,000 followers on Twitter. And 13 is my lucky number, because of course it is. And I asked Twitter what they wanted to do to celebrate, and you guys said you would like to do a Q&A. So you sent me some questions, and I'm going to answer as many of the questions as I can. Not all of them, but most of them. So we'll see how long this takes. But enjoy! What was the first vampire story you ever read, and when did you read it? Well, um, I don't remember. I'm sure I read vampire stories as a child, so I mean, this Panicula account, but the first one that really got me into vampires would be Christopher Pike's The Last Vampire series, which has been remarketed in this generation as Thirst, I think. And it's a six book series, and Christopher Pike was like R.L. Stein's arch nemesis back in the day. I don't know if they actually care about each other, but it was like you either were an R.L. Stein fan and you read Fear Street or you were a Christopher Pike fan. And I was a Christopher Pike fan, mainly because of the Last Vampire series. I love that series. I wanted to be her. She was the first vampire character that made me want to be a vampire. And you know, when I was 12, I thought maybe that could actually happen someday. Maybe it still can. There was also this book, which was my mother's, um, and she's had this for, you know, 40 years or however long it's been in existence. And it's a pop-up book, and the second page in it is Dracula. Try to get some glare not to show there. And look, he climbs down the wall. And I loved this book when I was a teeny tiny thing. My mom kept it tucked away on the bottom shelf of our bookcase, and I would sneak it off and read it. And this was also um, my first introduction to, well, there's the pit and the pendulum. Phantom of the Opera, look at that. This was it's the last one in here because Phantom's the best, so they save it for last. When did your fascination with vampires and the like start? Well, besides the whole Christopher Pike thing, um, I liked that vampire, but I didn't really consider myself a fan of the vampire genre when I was in middle school. But in high school, I had a friend who was very into Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles, and she got me into them, and there was no turning back after that. So I read Interview with the Vampire, The Vampire Lestat, Queen of the Damned, Tale of the Body Thief, Memnoth the Devil, then I got to the Vampire Armand, and it was too sexy for me as a very asexual high schooler who still didn't know what her sexuality was. So I put that one off and I didn't read any more until I was older and more mature and able to process that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's, it's always Anne Rice's fault. But what turned it from just liking the books into a lifestyle would be fan fiction. I started writing a lot of fan fiction and playing online role-playing games as these vampire characters from Vampire Chronicles and there was a fandom and I had friends and it was great and everything went from there. There is still some of my Anne Rice Vampire Chronicles fanfiction out there on the internet. Of course, it's secret because, you know, fanfiction is not allowed for that literary universe. There are rules. Yeah, that's a big thing. You should Google that. But it's out there. How did you get into vampires? Well, besides everything I just said, I was always into dark things, even when I was little. I remember playing ninjas with my brothers and my Brothers were always the white ninjas and I had to be the dark evil ninja, but I think the vampire thing was a natural evolution from my obsession with Phantom of the Opera, because vampires were like the Phantom, but with superpowers. So that was always cool. Do you think there's any chance of vampire films reclaiming mainstream success again? Notice there hasn't been any in a while. Well, I think individual vampire films will be successful in the future maybe a little more down the line after the whole burnout thing fades, but I don't think we're going to have a year like we had a couple years ago with 12 vampire films in one year. I don't think that's ever going to happen again, and I don't think it needs to because it makes people hate vampires. So if we just focus on good films being made passionately for good reasons, not trying to chase a trend, we'll get some good vampire films again, and they'll be mainstream and successful. 
it's going to take someone really creative and brilliant to come up with the ideas to make those stories. And I'm not that creative and brilliant. I'm not going to be that filmmaker, but I hope that person is out there and will give it to us because we want it. We're waiting. Any vampire movies you refuse to showcase on your show? Nope. Not that I can think of. I like to challenge myself to find something somewhat fresh to say about every single different vampire film. If there are some that are so much like things I've already talked about and I'm going to be repeating my analysis points, then I'd be less inclined to review them. But if a Patreon wanted to submit that request and pay for the pledge, I'd do it. I'd find a way. And I like that challenge. I like making me have to stretch my brain to come up with something different to say about the same thing in different ways because vampires are so versatile and I think, I think there's a way. Are there any opinions on vampire media that you would like to be able to share but can't do so to limitations by the Maven persona? Maven is a lot less limited than I used to make her. For instance, you may have noticed that I don't shit on Twilight as much anymore. Because, you know, I don't want to contribute to that kind of misogyny. And it was fun back then, but I've grown. She would never admit that there's anything better than vampires. But I might admit that sometimes. But if I'm talking about vampire movies, I don't think it's going to come up. But I think I could find a way to work any opinion that is my opinion into her more limited persona somehow. I'll make it work. But she's, she's an evolving creature too. You know, who, who is ever static? Not my fake alter ego that I pretend to be on YouTube. Have you seen the Vampire Diaries and will you ever talk about the show? I have not actually. I want to, but it seems like such a commitment. I mean, there's so much of it. When I start running low on stuff to talk about, then maybe I'll do the work and catch up and... I was considering actually doing a watch through and then making a vlog about each episode or something about each season, but I wasn't sure how well that would go over with my audience. I don't make any money off of YouTube. Um, so anything that I do that I'm actually earning income from is from Patreon requests and I wouldn't want to charge my Patreons for Vampire Diaries vlogs. So I don't really have the time right now to make videos for free. But if one of my patrons tomorrow came up to me and said, I'd like to request you to review season one of The Vampire Diaries, and yeah, I'd do it right away. But if that doesn't happen, I'll get to it on my own eventually. One day. I mean, don't hold your breath or anything, unless you actually are a vampire, in which case you probably have that power. Will you ever do a vampire musical review? And if you will, will you ever do one with Paul? There's quite a few vampire musicals out there, albeit not highly regarded. I Kissed a Vampire, Lestat by Elton John, Tonster Vampire... That one Buffy episode, um, that Scooby-Doo one. So stage musicals are hard to make review videos out of because there's usually not good quality footage of them to show on the screen while I talk, especially of the ones that flopped really hard on Broadway, which would be the most interesting ones. But things like the Buffy episode and Scooby-Doo, I would do for sure. Probably not with Paul just because he's not really interested in being on camera anymore. He does a lot of behind the scenes stuff. If you know Paul, he used to have a web show where he reviewed musicals. Now he edits podcasts and he is the podcast editing meister. I was actually going to review that Scooby-Doo song of the vampire movie with Paul a few years ago and also with Nella and Justin Carmichael, Jew Wario. And the four of us were going to dress up as the Scooby-Doo characters. You know, Justin was going to be Fred, I was going to be Daphne, Nell was going to be Velma, Paul was going to be Shaggy. I mean, how perfect would that have been? And we, we had it all planned, but we didn't get it together in time for MAGFest or Con Bravo or wherever it was going to be that we would all be together. And then that was the last time I ever saw Justin. So it's not that... It's ruined for me now, and I'm never going to review that movie, but I think I need a little more time before I'll be ready to do that. And when I do, I'll probably just tackle it on my own. But if you like seeing my interactions with Paul, because, you know, we have a dynamic, you uh, we're doing a Let's Play together. We're playing through Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, and 
he is fun to have along for that ride, and he's also very helpful because uh, he's much better at gaming than I am. That's on my YouTube channel if you want to watch that. Favorite line or quote from Anne Rice Vampires? Oh my god, you, you make me have to choose. Um, I don't know. Well, I, I don't want to call this my favorite quote, but it's the first one that's coming to mind. And it's a great quote. I'll call it one of my favorite quotes. Uh, it's something Lestat says in the Vampire Lestat when he's analyzing what it means to be a vampire and what vampires represent to him when he's still kind of a new vampire. And he says, I'm gentleman death in silk and lace, come to put out the candles, the canker in the heart of the rose. And I loved that idea of him seeing himself as a personification of death, because first of all, you know, I love personifications of deaths and comparing the vampire as a character, like a creature to be a personification of death added a whole level of death as a person, the Grim Reaper, my favorite characterness into every vampire thing ever. And it was something that I hadn't thought about in those terms before. So I love that quote in that book. Did you read the graphic novel Claudia's story? If so, what did you think of it? I have it right here. Where is it? Oh, here it is. This is such a pretty book. Look how beautiful this is. It's kind of in a like a manga style art. You probably can't see this, but it is a gorgeous graphic novel. And it's an interview with a vampire told from Claudia's perspective. And it's cute, and it's lovely, and it's great. And a very pretty book. And I just love having pretty books on my shelf. Have you read any Discworld books with the vampires in? Mainly Carpe Jugulum. If so, what are your thoughts? I have not. I actually wasn't letting myself read any Discworld, even though I was aware of it because I was writing a book series with death as a main character and I know death is a thing in Discworld and I didn't want Terry Pratchett's death to influence my death in any way. So I had read Masquerade, which is the one that makes fun of Phantom of the Opera back when I was a teenager, but I didn't read any more until recently after I finished my whole series. And then I let myself start reading them and I've been reading the death ones, but I haven't read any of the vampire ones yet. Um, I'd like to, because I love Terry Pratchett. He's great. I'll give you my thoughts on that when I get to it. Regarding the are vampires are different trope, if you could become a vampire from whichever franchise you wanted, which franchise would you choose? Um, Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles? I mean, obviously. The best. Well, her vampires are, like, gods. Which... It's pretty cool. They're like total superheroes. They can fly, they're telekinetic, they have pyrokinetic, they can do astral projection. They're really strong, really fast. And that's awesome. I mean, who wouldn't want those powers? Also, they're just, that's my soft spot. And I don't need to be a kind of vampire that would be awake during the day. Psh. Which vampire character would you most like to meet in real life? What's that? No, he'd probably kill me, but what a way to go. Should fangs be on the incisors or the canines or both? What is the best fang placement? Uh, canines, yeah. Incisor fangs look like rabbit teeth. No, canines are the best place. Where do you buy Maven's clothing from? I bought a lot of it on eBay, actually, back when I was in high school and college. And I've had most of the clothes that you see me wear for over a decade. I actually haven't been able to buy anything new in a while, just for financial reasons. There was a time in the mid-2000s where gothy clothes were kind of in at stores like Express or BB or H&M, and I got a lot of things there. The corsets mostly came from eBay. You can probably find them all on eBay. I did a thing where people were selling bundles of their used goth clothing on eBay. Like you just buy a sack of someone's used goth clothes and if it was your size and I got a couple of those and there are a few good things and a few bad things and I still have a lot of them. The Victorian gowns that I don't wear that often because a lot of them are really pastel and I like to wear, you know, darker colors. Those I got on eBay as well. And I was collecting 
Victorian gowns that kind of reminded me of Phantom of the Opera style for a while, too. I haven't shopped on eBay in years. But you know where I would like to buy Maven's clothing from when I have money is DraculaClothing.com. Have you heard of it? It looks so cool. I've been, I just go there and drool over the clothes like every couple weeks or so, but one of these days, I'll, I'll get me some DraculaClothing.com clothing. What are your least favorite vampire-related tropes and cliches? I guess I would say the Christianity weaknesses stuff. Not because I think it's bad or anything and I get the significance of it in classic literature, but I'm tired of it and it doesn't make sense in this day and age for vampires to be affected by Christian symbols. Like, it's such a narrow point of view for what the vampire means. And unless the vampire is a creature that was created by a Christian god, why would Christian religious symbols affect a vampire? And there's so many other cultures out there that are important and have been around for much longer. And if we're going to pretend vampires are real, affiliating them with one religious system, whether you believe it is the only system or not, just doesn't make sense. And I wouldn't use any of that in my writing of vampires. When I write vampires, crosses in holy water and all of that doesn't matter to them. Where did you get the skulls from and how long have you had them? This one was a gift from a friend. This one has fangs on it. I've had this one for maybe about six or seven years. Um, I actually don't have a lot of my original skulls anymore. They've kind of fallen apart because most of them I got from Target or Halloween stores. And when it's Halloween and stores like Target bring out the Halloween decorations, I shop for regular home decor. Um, this one's from Michael's. I actually have a matching set. Uh, this candle I got in Germany from a street fair when I went there as a 12-year-old with a school trip. But yeah, uh, Target, Halloween stores. I like ones that aren't too cheesy or gory looking, that look more kind of classy. I had one skull that was very lightweight. It was made of foam and you used to see it in my set a lot, but I gave it to my former roommate, Kyle Calgren, who does the show Brows Held High because he needed a skull to make into a Klingon skull. So that's where that one went. And my black sparkly one, alas, spit the dust. But you know, they come and go and people give me a lot as gifts. I get a lot of decorative skulls as gifts. These ones are place card holders. Like if you're having a dinner party and you want to put your place card in, that's a skull. A lot of them are salt and pepper shakers, actually, like this right here. This is a raven and skull salt and pepper shaker set. You know, the pepper comes out of there. These ones are salt and pepper shakers. I have another set that I actually use as salt and pepper shakers, you know, in my kitchen. Was it nerve wracking to start your own channel and embrace your geeky persona slash alter ego? Did you know you wanted to make money from creating video reviews? And did you believe you would be successful? And what advice do you have for people who want to do the same thing? I had a lot of time to ease into it working with Lindsay when I was doing the nostalgia chick stuff with her and other channel awesome people for years before I even started making my own show. And everybody already knew what a geek I was from that. So that wasn't an issue. There was no shame there. The most nerve wracking part is probably coming up with ideas for things to say, because writing is hard. I never thought I would make a living off doing Maven, but back then when I was on Blip, I made $8 per 1,000 clicks, and I make like nothing on YouTube now. I mean, I make like $2 per 1,000, but I get a third as many hits on YouTube as I used to get on Blip, so Back then I was doing it maybe for a little extra income, but I didn't expect to make money off of it. But now with Patreon, I actually can. And because I have a lot going on in my life right now, I wouldn't do it if I couldn't make money off of it. I just don't have the time to afford to do things like that for free because it does take up so much time. So my advice would be to not expect to make money. I didn't start from zero. I stood on Lindsay's shoulders and on Channel Awesome's shoulders. And then by the time Patreon came along, I had been doing this for five years and had been building an audience for five years. So if you're starting from zero, do it for yourself. 
and your passion and take joy in that and do not have any expectations of anything more. Don't expect an audience, don't expect money. And then if that happens, then yay. But if you have this sense of entitlement from it, you'll get discouraged very quickly. Who have been your biggest inspirations as a video creator? Do you mean besides Lindsay, who I still work with actually, um, you don't see me in her videos anymore, but I do still work with her on stuff. There's Elvira, obviously, but I'm thinking you probably mean other YouTubers. And honestly, I was completely outside the YouTube bubble back in the Channel Awesome days when I was working on Nostalgia Chick and we just had blip. And I knew nothing of this whole YouTube world and the YouTube culture. And by the time I transferred my show from blip to YouTube, I was already my own thing. But since then, I've been trying to watch more channels and catch up and see who else is out there. And if they wind up influencing me, we'll see. But I'm just getting started with that. Do you have any advice for how to be more analytical and critical when looking at media? I'd love to be able to write as well as you do. Oh, thanks. I think of it as writing an essay for like one of my college literature classes. You have your thesis and then you use the media or other scholarly discussion of it to support your statement and interpretation. I usually try to stick to about four thesis points per video and keep them at about 20 minutes. But if I don't have any fresh points to make because maybe this vampire film is kind of the same as something else I've talked about before, I'll focus on the individual vampire characters and talk about what makes them interesting as characters or interesting as vampires. Since I'm a writer and my background is in theater, not in film, I've never studied film on any kind of professional level. I usually focus on the writing and the script and how well the film frames and presents the characters to the audience. So I guess my advice would be to pick your strength and structure your videos around that, on what you were interested in talking about. Don't try to talk about every single part of the movie. I don't talk about the special effects. I don't talk about the filmmaking or the lighting or anything, because that's not my area of expertise. So do what's best for you, and people will want to watch it if you know what you're talking about, and if you have passion. What do you find to be some of the most rewarding things about doing vampire reviews? Learning more about vampires? I was not a vampire expert when I started this show. I was just a fan with admittedly biased preferences, but you know, that's where the character of Maven came from, that self-indulgent vampire snobbery. But I've expanded my understanding of how they're used in art and storytelling so much, and it's made me a much better writer myself. So hopefully I've been able to do that for other people as well, if you've been watching my show. The book I keep talking about that I wrote that's coming out this year has vampires in it. And I came up with that story before I started doing vampire reviews. And I just wonder how would it have been different if I came up with it now? And the next time I write a story with vampires in it, will they be so much better? There's some more questions about my book. Romero zombies, approximate page count, tone. So the zombies in my book are, yeah, sort of Romero style. And there's also other kind of zombies. I wanted it to be this like monster soup. So I have zombies that are slow, like The Walking Dead. And then I have fast ones like you know, the World War Z movie and I mix them in together. And that's part of the lore that you have these different kinds of zombies and what makes them different. As for page count, there's no way to know that until the publisher formats the book. I don't know how big the font's gonna be, how many words on a page, but it's 96, 1,700 words and you usually estimate 250 words per page. So that would be 387 pages. The tone of my series is, well, I don't want to call it light. I mean, it's definitely not comedy, but it's not heavy because it is about the end of the world, but you have these characters who either have a sarcastic sense of humor or they're just cheerful people and they're thrown into these dark, scary situations. So they have a, a dry way of reacting to it, but they're still dealing with scary situations. As a fellow vampire writer with a small fledgling underfoot, what tricks do you have for success? Do you have any advice on how to remain focused and motivated while working on long-term creative projects like that while balancing day-to-day -day responsibilities? Well, the reason I do Patreon and Vampire Reviews in large part is to fund full-time daycare for my child. Right now, 100% of my Patreon earning goes to his daycare, but 
that way I have time to write. So I spend about two weeks a month working on vampire videos and the other two weeks I work on writing and I couldn't do it if I was full-time caretaker for my child. So daycare is my answer. But aside from that, I make a lot of lists, lots and lots of lists. I write down every single thing I need to do and then I split it up over my days and I keep notes on everything as they pop into my head. I write everything down so that I don't forget it. I plan out what my family's going to eat. I plan out when I'm going to exercise and I'm very efficient and organized. Even when I'm working on books, I'll write down what scene I need to work on today for my new project, what scene I need to edit for my finished project, and what section of research I need to do for my vampire reviews. And I break it all up and I make checklists so that way I don't forget when I make a video, I make a checklist of all the different levels of things I need to edit. And, you know, I know these things in my head, but writing it down helps me plan and sort it out. What's your most obscure fandom? I don't really participate in fandoms anymore. Just kind of lurk and gaze from afar and scroll through things on Tumblr without saying anything. I used to write tons of fan fiction and I ran a forum uh, and I was a participator on forums back when forums were a thing. And the most obscure one would probably have been Wuthering Heights because I had about four fandom friends in that fandom and we were the loneliest Wuthering Heights fan in the world. But we wrote our fan fiction and we had our forum and shared our dank memes. Yeah, talk about a dead fandom. I mean, the fandom of the opera fandom is pretty dead too. The Anne Rice Vampire Chronicles fandom is pretty dead too. I'm like that dinosaur that says all my friends are dead, except all my fandoms are dead. What piece of media do you want there to be more fan art of? Well, Vampire Chronicles. You know, if we could have more stuff like this. There was some really pretty stuff on DeviantArt, but nobody does it anymore. There's a lot out there, but I've seen it all and I want more because there's so many characters in that series and they're all so pretty. How were you first exposed to Phantom? Also, do you have any advice for aspiring internet reviewers? How were you first exposed to Phantom? Well, you know, there was this book with, you know, he's got an organ and there's like a door with bats up here. And the quote in here is from the book, not the musical. This is all literature based. And it says, suddenly I felt a need to see beneath the mask. I wanted to know the face of the voice. And with a movement which I was utterly unable to control, swiftly my fingers tore away the mask. Oh, horror, horror, horror. And then she tears away his mask. So then when I was five or six years old, I was on the playground at kindergarten. And I heard this other girl talking about going to see the Phantom of the Opera, which would have been the Los Angeles production back in the day. And I remember her saying something about someone going through a mirror and then screaming. And the way she was talking about it gave me this impression that it was the epitome of all things. Like this was highest art. So I had this idea in my head that Phantom of the Opera was highest art. And the images in my head were from this book. And then when I was about 11, I got a CD of the musical and I listened to it and I was like, she doesn't go through the mirror and scream. She just hits a high note. And I got into the musical for a while and I read the book and I joined the web forums and stuff. And then I got very snobby about being an elitist of the book and the musical was to be frowned upon and only the pure fans liked the book. And I wrote a lot of fan fiction. I did have two friends in middle school that were into it that encouraged my nerdery, but it was really when I got the internet, which I was 14, I was a freshman in high school, that, that's when it took off because there were Phantom of the Opera chat rooms on AOL and I used to hang out in those every day after school. Do you have any favorites amongst all the actors that have played Christine and Phantom in the Lloyd Webber musical? Well, the best ones I ever saw, the best performance I ever saw, and I've seen the musical more times than I can count, I would estimate maybe about 26 times, but I honestly don't know, would be David Gashin, who was an understudy for The Phantom that day. And I was sitting front row because, of course, I was actually in New York, um, where I used to live. You could get front row tickets for Phantom on the day of the show, which I think was they held those seats for some reason. And then if they were still available, they'd let anyone buy it and they'd be $25 because, you know, last minute sales. So when I was a broke college student, that's what I did. 
And I was sitting right up front and we had an understudy, but I was excited because I had already seen the person who was playing the Phantom back then. And I could just see the emotions in Gashin's eyes and just the way he played the character just blew my mind. I had never seen it, maybe because I had never been that close before. I'd sat front row for other people and didn't see it. But with him, it just... And then I saw him in Phantom again. He usually was understudying Pianji. So I saw him backstage at one point when I was doing a tour and I told him that he was my favorite Phantom. For Christine, that would be Lisa Roman because she's just spectacular. Her voice is so beautiful. That isn't all the questions, but I'm going to stop there because the rest of the questions I either didn't quite know how to answer or were too similar to ones I already answered. Thank you so much for asking me questions and thank you so much for following me on Twitter. Yay, we hit 13,000 followers. Next, we need to hit 13 million followers. And then I'll do another one of these Q&As. Just kidding. This was fun. If you want me to do this again, let me know. Maybe it can happen again in the future. Until then, good night. I love you. And I'll see you on Twitter.